Hello, welcome everyone. And welcome to the fourth and final webinar of Sustainable Conservation's Recharging California web, webinar series. Thank you all for joining us today. I'm thrilled to be here with the Sustainable Conservation Program leads. Before we get started, I'd like to thank our sponsors, Environmental Science Associates, Holland and Knight, and Spotswood Estate Winery and Vineyard for supporting our fall webinar and sharing Sustainable Conservation's vision for stewarding our most precious natural resources for all Californians. I'm Celeste Pantu, and I have the privilege of being a board member of Sustainable Conservation. I've worked in the water world for many decades, and I know that taking care of our um, environment is the most important thing we can do, and it's becoming increasingly challenging with the onset of climate change, and sustainable conservation gets it right, which is a very sophisticated and complicated approach that is a success every time. For those of you who may be new, sustainable conservation is a nonprofit organization dedicated to advancing the collaboration stewardship of California's land, air, and water for the benefit of nature and people. Every day, sustainable conservation teams uh, bring together business, landowners, scientists, government, water agencies, nonprofits, and others to advance collaborative solutions to steward the natural, natural resources that we all depend on in ways that are just and make economic sense. Throughout our fall 2024 Recharging California series, Sustainable Conservation has explored how climate change is affecting California and how more extreme weather events like drought and flood are changing how we think about water across the state. We're highlighting groundwater recharge as a vital tool to our climate adaptation toolkit. And we've discussed strategies to scale and incentivize recharge. If you missed the first three discussions in this series, you can still watch the recordings on YouTube channel. Today, we'll zoom out a bit. While groundwater recharge is vital to boosting California's climate resilience, it is one piece of the puzzle. Sustainable conservation is committed to a holistic and whole watershed approach and integrates our program work across ecosystems, restoration, soil health, and groundwater recharge and water quality to piece together a picture of a vibrant, healthy, and climate resilient California. I'm excited to be joined by Sustainable Conservation's program leads to dive deeper into their respective program initiatives and how these initiatives integrate and complement each other. Before our panelists introduce themselves, I'd like to first get a chance to know all of you we have a easy peasy three part poll, which you will be filling out. Asking, we're asking where you're tuning in from today, what field of work you're in, and how you'd rate your, le your level of knowledge on climate change adaptation and mitigation. So these are your choices. So far, the Bay Area is taking the lead with the largest percentage of people, but Sacramento Valley is creeping up and we have a good showing from Sierra Nevada. Northern California coast, I think we have just 6%, so we'd like to see a little bit more people in that. Southern California coast is 5%. Southern California inland, where I come from, is 8% so far, and we have 7% of out-of-staters. Now, I live in the Inland Empire. However, in order to participate in this webinar today, I had to drive an hour and a half to San Diego where there's power because we've lost all of our power because of uh, high winds and wildfire protection. This is another manifestation of climate change. So it's here and now and it's real. I think we're ending up with Bay Area with the largest percentage of 
followed by Sacramento Valley at 25%. And then everybody else is pretty evenly distributed in single digits. And what best describes your affiliation? We have some from academia, a good showing from ag, which I'm very pleased to see. Business is 7%, foundation is 7%, and government and nonprofits together make up the bulk with nonprofits at 39% and government at 24%. Of course, those are our partners. As actually, many of these groups are our partners. We have some students, we have water agencies, and we have other. So we have to figure out who the others are. How would you rate your level of knowledge on climate change mitigation and adaptation? Strong feeling towards average with a good 21% and expert. So Californians are pretty wise. And I think we've seen the impacts all around us and people have taken it upon themselves to understand uh, what needs to be done on the personal level and the regional level, city level and state level to try to mitigate and adapt to climate change. Thank you very much for sharing a little bit about yourself. At this point, I'm excited for you to meet our panelists. We'll start with introduction and we'll go in alphabetical order. So are we ready to move away from the poll results and move into introductions? I'm pushing, oh, maybe I shouldn't have pushed that. Well, I did push the button for polls. Um, I think we should get started with introductions. Aisha, will you start? Sure, good morning, everyone. My name is Aisha Massell. I'm the program director for our Water for the Future program here at Sustainable Conservation. I've been here a little over four years. It's been a wonderful time here. And um, you know, just a brief overview of what our program does is uh, we've been focused on groundwater recharge for over a decade. And we started off with a basic approach, kind of a fundamental approach of how to help growers and districts prepare for and manage recharge activities. And we continue with this work um, and are now exploring multi-benefit recharge, um, which is in our estimation is how to conduct recharge to benefit ecosystems and community drinking water in particular. Great to see you all. Thank you, Aisha. Erica, you're next. Hi, everybody. Uh, great to be here today. Glad you could join us. I'm Erica Lovejoy, and I am the director of our Accelerating Restoration Program here at Sustainable Conservation. I've been with the organization about 13 years, so I'm a long timer. And our program works to increase the pace and scale of habitat restoration by developing policy and regulatory efficiencies so we can get more restoration done. And a lot of folks know us for our work uh, around simplifying the permitting process for habitat restoration. Thanks. Lee. Thank you. Ryan, you're next. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, Ryan Flaherty, I am uh, the director of two of our programs. Uh, I've been at the organization for a little over 10 years, so not quite as long as Erica, but close. Uh, I'm based out of our Modesto office here in Central California. Um, and programmatically, one of the programs uh, that I lead is our longstanding Waste Not program, uh, which focuses on protecting drinking water quality by rethinking how we utilize manure and, and agricultural waste to reduce nitrate leaching to groundwater. Um, the other program is uh, a newer program called Solutions in Our Soil, which really focuses on how we can use soils to improve our ability to capture and store water, as well as recycle the nutrients uh, for water quality protection. It's great to be here. Thank you, Ryan. Now time for the questions. Thank you all for the important work that you do and for taking the time to be on this webinar today. I'm going to ask our panelists a few questions and we'll have time at the end of the questions for the audience and the, at the end of all the questions. So feel free to type your questions in the Q&A box as questions arise and we'll try to get to everyone's questions towards the end. Since most of this webinar series has focused on recharge, 
but we know the importance of taking an interconnected approach to climate adaptation and mitigation. So first, I'd like to start off with the discussing how your programs that are focused on soil health, ecosystem restoration, and water quality protection connect you to your recharge work. Ryan, would you like to start us off? Sure, so I can take that first one on soil health and the connection to recharge. Um, so if you think about it in, in a nutshell, recharge is about slowing down surplus water and getting it into the ground, right? Um, so when we look at recharge potential, uh, we're looking at a lot of different things to understand, you know, how the potential for recharge. A lot of things like slope or soil type, underlying geology, these are all really important things to think about to understand how a particular site, how well suited that might be to get that surplus water into the ground. Um, but there are also other factors that could influence, you know, how water flows and how much it gets into the ground, to what extent we can really slow down that water and get it into the ground. Um, and that's where the kind of connection to soil health and soil health practices can come in. So um, things like what's on the surface of the land, right? So you can imagine if you have bare ground, if you have a pavement or you have kind of dirt, um, that water runs off pretty quickly when you have high flows of water. Um, however, if you have uh, stuff on the surface, take vegetation, for example, uh, there that's the water will hit that and it will slow it down as it moves across the landscape. So it can really slow it down. Um, and so things like cover crops or hedgerows or buffer strips are all kind of soil health practices that can also really help slow down that water. Um, that's just the first part where you've got to slow it down, then you got to get it into the ground. Um, and so, um, you know, soil characteristics beyond soil type are also really important. Um, so for example, you could have sandy soils, um, which typically let water run through pretty quickly. But if you have surface crusting on the soil, it's going to be really hard for water to get into it. Um, so things like cover crops, for example, can uh, help penetrate that soil surface and allow water to get in. And then the roots that are in the ground can help then create channels for the water to flow down and ultimately get deeper where it can get into the aquifer. Um, so we're, we're looking at that. We're excited to look at to what extent we can actually increase the amount of water that kind of slows down and gets into the ground and ultimately into the aquifer for recharge by uh, implementing different soil health practices. Thank you. Erica, tell us about your program. Um, thanks, Celeste. Uh, so I want to actually use a couple of, uh, a couple of slides to demonstrate these points. I like to use pictures to tell a story. Um, so I'm hoping after, let me just get this going. Just a sec. Yeah. All right. You see slides. Yes. Excellent. That's what we want. All right. So we in re, in relation to the accelerating restoration pro, uh, program, how it relates to water and recharge. Of course, we know that. Water enables life, and we've got to do everything we can to protect and restore our aquatic resources so they can be healthy. But of course, we know that human development has also had a major impact on our natural resources, and many of our habitats are degraded. So our Accelerating Restoration Program has been working to increase the pace and scale of essential habitat restoration projects that restore wetlands, rivers, and our coastal areas. So what I wanted to do was take a look at a major floodplain restoration project uh, that was done by our friends at the nonprofit uh, organization River Partners. So the picture you see here is the Dos Rios Preserve, which is near Modesto at the confluence of the Tuolumne and Stanislaus Rivers. And what River Partners did is they restored about 1,600 acres of riverside habitat along about eight miles of stream. It's a very, very big project. And the area was formerly agricultural and, land, and ranch land, and it was subject to a lot of flooding, uh, even though 
the ranch land had berms built up around it to disconnect the floodplain from the river. Uh, so, so what you have here in this picture on the left hand side is you can see the area uh, before where there was agricultural land and then uh, on the right side, you can see the after uh, when the restoration was done. So here's another picture uh, showing the, the post project implementation where vegetation is growing back on the floodplain. You can see a little water there on the floodplain as well. And this project had several benefits. So first, there was a major improvement in habitat for fish, birds, all the other critters out there, uh, like the Aleutian cackling goose. This bird is uh, was previously endangered. Now it's delisted because of this project. There's riparian, you know, cute little fuzzy riparian brush rabbits, uh, little ri uh, riparian birds like the least bells vireo. Excellent habitat benefits. And then another benefit of this project is that when we have a lot of rain and flooding, water spreads out over the floodplain and percolates into the ground. You heard uh, Ryan talking about this. And this helps to recharge the groundwater table and replenish our water supplies. And that's especially important during times of drought. And uh, we can all appreciate that here in California. And because floodplains are a significant natural buffer, the flood water from uh, the river also gets slowed down when it hits the floodplain instead of flooding our local communities. So this type of nature-based solution is more sustainable and cost-effective than traditional engineered type flood control measures. And it can reduce the pressure on our existing levees and urban infrastructure. So, so Projects like Dos Rios really demonstrate how leveraging natural processes can create a win-win solution for communities, our water supply, and the environment. Um, so that's an example of some of the work that our program does uh, related to water. Thank you, Erica. Aisha, tell us how your program helps. Well, you know, the Water for the Future program is all about water, as the name indicates. Um, so I'm, I'm going to take this opportunity to talk about how our work with Recharge uh, is connected to our other program work with Ryan and Erica's teams. Um, so first of all, water quality is really important to consider when we're looking at groundwater recharge. Uh, and this really ties in with the work of uh, Ryan's team. Uh, in 2021, we developed a general framework for how to protect water quality when conducting on-farm recharge in particular. Uh, and I think Hannah can share that link to that document, one of those documents um, in the chat. And um, this, this, this type of guidance uh, includes best practices for how to manage nutrient input uh, at the field level to reduce leaching. Uh, and this is both during recharge events, but also during the, the growing season as well, just uh, outlining basic best practices. Um, and also, you know, different strategies such as uh, targeting recharge water uh, repeatedly to the same acreage versus spreading it everywhere a little bit at a time. And what that can help to do is uh, both reduce the amount of flushing that occurs from any contaminants that can occur at the surface, but also helps to dilute any contaminants that may already exist in the aquifer or, or gets pushed down um, during rain or recharge. And so um, we're continuing to look at how recharge affects groundwater quality uh, this coming year with a technical advisory committee. We're really excited about this. Um, they're gonna help us outline what is known about the effects of recharge on drinking water quality as well as identifying gaps in knowledge um, and the data needed to fill those gaps. Uh, and so we're hoping to create um, a geospatial tool uh, that will help water managers make the best, best informed decisions about where to place water uh, for recharge versus where it might not be a good idea to put water. Um, and then we're also, you know, speaking more to Erica's work and her team, um, we're exploring how recharge could potentially help improve habitat and ecosystems. And uh, so there's a lot of different approaches that we can take. We can target recharge uh, to benefit groundwater dependent ecosystems. This is something we worked on with the, ground, um, with the watershed studies with uh, DWR and others. Uh, we're also looking at developing recharge basins um, that are habitat friendly and really improving the guidance and the and and creating more examples of, of that approach out, out in the world. And also looking at designing creekside basins that accept flood water, kind of to Erica's point where we're looking at 
these flashy small creeks where we can have basins that are right next to the creek, kind of mini floodplains that help to reduce flood risk, improve habitat, and also do some recharge, uh, excuse me, uh, recharge as well. Thank you. So we've heard Eric has said how they restore floodplains. So we've paved over and built houses on many of our floodplains, but how they can restore floodplains. And then Ryan's told us how in those floodplains, if you add the right kind of crops, you can help percolate that water into the aquifer where we need to keep it safe and sound. And Asha, ta Asha, Asha ta does talk to us about how all of that restores water quality, improves water quality, and also endangered species. So they all work together synergistically and comes out with a much better, more resilient situation. So let's expand on that and go a little bit deeper. Um, since we know recharge and water quality are a big part of the larger picture of climate resilience, besides beyond recharge, what can each of you speak to uh, in your work that your teams are doing on climate mitigation and adaptation to boost that very resilience? We'll start this time with Asia. You know, thinking about this question, um, you know, I think collaboration is, is really at the core of what we do here at Sustainable Conservation. And I think that uh, collaboration is really one of the most effective tools that we have to adapt to a changing climate. And so just as an example of some of our work, um, we're, we as an organization, we're part of an ongoing collaboration um, called the Fairmead Groundwater Resilience Project. Uh, this includes other NGOs, uh, including Fairmead Community and Friends, Self-Help Enterprises, Leadership Council for Justice and Accountability, and the Union of Concerned Scientists. And in this project, we're working uh, with the unincorporated community of Fairmead, who's in Madera County, to help them address their, their very urgent water issues. Uh, as a background, many of their domestic wells dried up during the drought a few years back, and they also had to dig a new and deeper community well. Despite their best efforts, however, people still live in fear every day that their faucets will run dry. Um, and so in this project, we're really looking at potential recharge projects to enhance water supply, but also at opportunities to repurpose irrigated land in order to reduce the pumping demand um, around Fairmead, which is located in a very agricultural region. So for instance, uh, you can take an almond orchard um, and it could be transformed to a field of agave. Um, so keeping in agricultural production, but using much less water, or it could become a community park or solar farm. Um, in this work, we're looking for solutions that address community concerns even beyond water, such as providing hedgerows of pollinator habitat um, as a sort of buffer uh, to help reduce dust or pesticide drift into people's homes. So really looking at kind of what the community um, is expressing through meetings with the community, um, and in trying to address a multitude of issues, even though our focus might be recharge, uh, you know, in our program, we're looking beyond just the recharge itself. And of course, you know, the funding to do these types of projects is really key to their success. And so Madera has been developing their multi-benefit agricultural land repurposing program, otherwise known as the MALRP. And it's just coming online now um, after years of care careful preparation. And so in this project, we're working with a couple of landowners in the Fairmead region who are interested in repurposing their orchard lands uh, for the benefit of the community. And so our groundwater, our Fairmead Groundwater Resilience team will help them to develop a project proposal and budget and help them apply to the MALRP program. And so what we're hoping out of all of this is that these projects will be successful for everyone involved. Um, the landowners, uh, the community, and the GSA, whose interest is really in reducing um, their water deficit and their water budget. And hopefully we'll provide an example of how to target repurposing of irrigated land in and around communities that are most vulnerable to climate change impacts while also ensuring uh, their long-term economic viability and their community health as well. Thank you. You can really start to see a picture coming together where you have these multi-purpose activities and that generate multi-benefits all to the benefit of protecting ourselves from climate change. Erica, tell us how your team works to mitigate or um, adapt to climate change. 
Sure. Uh, well, with the Accelerating Restoration Team, supporting implementation of more projects like the Dos Rios example I talked about earlier, that's really going to help create more climate resilience through improving habitat, recharging groundwater supplies, and then uh, things like helping to protect people from floods. And we also want to advance other types of restoration, um, like wetlands, for example, are a major carbon sink. We've lost about 90% of those habitats in California, so we've got to do whatever we can to accelerate their restoration. And then we also need more resilience in our coastal areas uh, to protect communities and nearshore habitats from sea level rise and storm surge, and to do things like protecting uh, and re well restoring our kelp forests to capture more carbon. And I think we all know <laughs> that the bottom line is we don't really have time to waste in order to get these projects done. But unfortunately, our regulatory systems can be very slow and complex, and they weren't really initially set up to fix environmental problems, and they certainly did not anticipate the impacts of climate change and all of this urgencies. So uh, all of this urgency, because uh, you know project implementers have to go to seven or eight agencies. It can take several years to get permits for these projects. And our accelerating restoration team, along with others, have been working in partnership uh, for many years now with agencies and project proponents to put habitat restoration on a separate regulatory path by creating more efficient regulatory processes that are specifically designed to move restoration forward. And the good news is that uh, a lot of progress has been made and many of the state and federal agencies have new processes that are in place that help advance these high priority uh, habitat and climate resilience projects. Um, there's also a new state cutting green tape initiative and teams and agencies that are helping to catalyze project uh, progress. Um, some of the work that we're doing now involves around uh, uh, providing resources on how to use a lot of these new restoration permitting tools because it takes time to learn a new process. Uh, regulations are complicated, so we're helping agencies uh, with the rollout of these new permits in part through our technical assistance program where we advise project implementers on uh, how to use some of these efficient permitting pathways. And then we also have a, a dedicated restoration permitting website, uh, acceleratingrestoration.org. I see one of my colleagues just put it in the chat. It's very, very comprehensive. It has information on all, all the different agencies, processes, can help folks move forward. So please check it out. But even with this good progr uh, progress that's been made, we know that there's still more work to be done to ramp up restoration at the pace and scale necessary uh, to respond to these cl anticipated climate impacts. And we recently did a very large study and published a new report on accelerating restoration in the Sacramento Valley and beyond. So what we did is we interviewed 39 different organizations, over 80 individuals to learn what is working well with restoration permitting and regulations and what else needs to be done to make more progress. And we, we dove deep <laughs> and developed a very detailed list of recommendations and proposed next steps. Um, and then we're now working with agencies and partners to help advance some of these recommendations. So uh, anybody who's interested in that report, I encourage you to take a look at the details and on our website. I also think a, a chat just got dropped, a chat link just got dropped on that as well. And uh, we see all of our accelerating restoration program work really is being complementary to the healthy soils and water teams work because these systems indeed are all interconnected and uh, we're trying to take a holistic systems approach to creating resilient watersheds. So that's what we're working on, Celeste. Thank you. That's, that's really important. When you think about it, our regulatory framework that we, that every regulator operates under was predicated first on making sure bad things did not happen to the environment. So some of that ended up with making certain things just don't happen. And so the idea of flipping it from making sure that good things can happen is really a paradigm shift. And it's so important that you're doing that work. How about you, Ryan? Tell us what you're, how you move the ball forward on climate change and resilience. 
Yeah, well, I think first, uh, kind of building on what I was talking about before, you know, one of the aspects of resiliency is also is obviously, uh, you know, we feel climate change in California through water, either lots of it or not enough of it. Um, so how we think about water quantity is important. Um, and I was talking before about um, how cover crops or their vegetative cover can help reduce runoff and increase infiltration. I forgot to mention, I've got an example behind me here uh, in an orchard, two nearby orchards, very similar soil types. After a big rain event, same day, the one uh, on this side is obviously still flooded. Uh, it had kind of bare ground. The one on this side has cover crops. You can see uh, all that water was infiltrated very quickly into the ground. Uh, so that's just an illustration of what we're talking about here. Um, and that's really, really important as we think about um, kind of building landscapes and watersheds that can really withstand those more intense precipitation and flooding events that we're expecting. Um, that also gets it into the ground and can hold it in the ground if you build up your soil and soil health. Um, and that's really important. Water in the ground means water available for use. And so that's really important as we think about surviving those prolonged periods of droughts, right? Uh, so if you have water in the soil, more water in the soil means less water needed to irrigate to grow crops. Um, so, you know, we're working on that. We've worked with a uh, hundred plus different folks across different types of expertise and types of organizations to kind of think about uh, how, you know, what is the role of kind of non-cash crop vegetation like cover crops as we implement the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. So kind of to be successful in getting our aquifers into balance, what is the role of this kind of vegetative cover on our surface? Um, and so we've uh, put out a report. Uh, we've got lots of upcoming kind of work in collaboration with many of these partners uh, to put out more guidance, to get research findings out, to do a lot more, to, to really ensure everyone has the knowledge uh, to, to do what they need to do for Sigma to be successful. Um, so we've got a, a blog that'll go in the chat to kind of give a summary of all that stuff going on. Um, the other aspect that I wanted to talk about, Aisha, you know, talked about earlier, um, is, is drinking water and community drinking water. So a piece of resiliency is making sure that our communities and our people uh, have what they need to, to survive and, and particularly access to clean drinking water is really important in the face of climate change. Um, so I'll just add a few more things that we're doing in our programs in addition to what Aisha already talked about, um, kind of staying on that theme of soils and soil health, uh, looking at, um, you know, when we look at some of the, um, one of the water quality issues that community face, uh, again, is nitrate, high nitrate concentrations that's coming from largely from agriculture. Um, and, um, you know, we can use cover crops, high carbon amendment, kind of lots, putting lots of carbon in the soil. There's lots of practices we can do uh, to hold that nitrogen. If there is excess nitrogen that's applied when you're growing crops, you can hold it in the soil uh, for later use. And so some practices like cover crops and high carbon amendments can do that. And, and we're doing a lot of work to better understand with our partners, um, how do you operationalize that as an agricultural producer? How do you know how much nitrogen is going to stay in the soil? And how can you bank on that uh, for your next cropping season? Uh, what, what, what can you be comfortable with? Um, another thing that we're doing uh, is really rethinking uh, manure and agricultural waste, particularly in the San Joaquin Valley. Um, so in the San Joaquin Valley here where I am, uh, we have a large dairy industry with cows, a lot of cows that are generating a lot of manure. Um, so that sounds bad, right? Well, not necessarily. Um, so if you, manure is the original fertilizer and soil amendment that we have before all of this other stuff, right? Um, so it's really about, I think, an opportunity. How do we manage that? Um, so we have about 300 other plus other types of crops that are being grown around the dairies that currently really rely pretty heavily on synthetic fertilizers to grow the crops. So, um, but those cows that I mentioned before uh, are already generating nitrogen and other nutrients there where those crops are being grown. Um, in fact, uh, it's estimated they're growing, um, that manure has uh, 
about enough nitrogen uh, to grow about 600 or 700,000 acres of almonds. Um, so we've got a significant source of nutrients that's here in the valley. And so if we can just rethink that and see how we can utilize that manure into different types of products or different ways um, to fertilize those other crops, to reduce synthetic fertilizer use and, and build soil health. Um, so we've been working on that. Uh, we're looking at things like simpler things like compost. Uh, how can we utilize, kind of create more compost and get that out? Uh, where we've developed a drip irrigation system that can utilize um, manure water. And so we're looking at, can we uh, apply that? It goes subsurface. So can we put that below the soil, use that to replace synthetic fertilizer and do that in a way that's protective of food safety? We think we can, uh, but we're gonna test it out with partners. Um, and we're also looking at um, how we can integrate that uh, manure into a concept called whole orchard recycling which is something that's being done increasingly where um, these orchards, these trees, as they reach the end of their kind of productive life, get ground up and put back into the soil. Uh, so it's a great way to get carbon into the soil, um, but it kind of ties up the nitrogen that's there. So instead of adding more synthetic fertilizer into that to compensate, could we add some of that manure? Um, so again, just really thinking about different ways to, to for a paradigm shift to rethink uh, are are kind of uh, at a at a at a regional level how we're utilizing our our manure nutrients um, and other types of agricultural waste. Um, so I think you know in doing so we we can protect water quality, the big one, uh, but also create air quality and and greenhouse gas benefits. And it's a business opportunity, so that's great. Um, so uh, I think we'll drop in the chat as well uh, another blog that kind of talks about how the soils and the Waste not programs address both of those sides of resiliency. So the water quantity as well as the water quality, drinking water protection side of things. You're really closing the loop there to you to rethink about what is a waste and making it into a resource. And it makes so much sense. I'm just really struck with, with the photographs behind you. I hadn't seen those before. The one on your right, our traditional way of cropping and just letting that water sit on top where it's subject to evaporation and pollution and can't really plan on using it again if it's just sitting there on top. And then the one to your left with the cover crop where it just sucks that water into the aquifer where it's safe and protect it from pollution and won't evaporate. And when we need it, it'll be there. It's brilliant. So now we're gonna ask you a really quick question. What is one aspect of your work that makes you most excited or hopeful? Asha, we'll start with you. You know, I really, um, I love uh, connecting dots between concepts, uh, such as how to use recharge to reduce flood risk or improve habitat. And, but I also like connecting uh, people, uh, the dots between people, and really thinking about how uh, growers and community members and water managers, as well as agency staff can help each other to really solve our most pressing water issues. So that's kind of what makes me excited. I, I really do think that most people want to be part of the solution. And when we really listen to each other, uh, then great things can happen. Thank you. Erica. Well, one of the things that makes me excited and hopeful is that um, we have made a lot of momentum in California with improving the regulatory situation for regulation and um, things have changed a lot. I mean, years ago, I can't tell you how many presentations I did uh, trying to convince agencies that we need to take different approaches, but things have evolved quite a bit. And one of the big reasons for that is because we have some very strong agency leaders in place. Change happens in agencies really through leadership, strong leadership, I believe. And uh, that's one of the ways. Uh, and then of course, staff being supported to embrace that change. But right now, um, those strong leaders are really making a difference like at our natural resources agency and, and other agencies. And so uh, keep up the good work, agency leaders. Keep, let's keep on making progress. Thank you. And Ryan, what makes you hopeful and excited? 
Well, uh, this may be cheating, but it's kind of the theme of this webinar. I mean, I think just if, as I look across all of our programs, we are really working on critical aspects to help us thrive on climate change. So what really makes me excited is seeing how all of our programs kind of come together to support to support that. Um, so what, what do I mean by that? I, mean, I think like if you can imagine where you live, you all, wherever you are uh, in the broader shed, watershed that you're in right now and, and imagine that more habitat restoration was happening more quickly in that area and farmers were building soil health to capture and hold more water and nutrients. Um, we were reducing that importation of synthetic fertilizers by kind of reusing what we have here uh, and more flood water is being captured to recharge and imp improve community drinking water and, and our ecosystems like this would be a much better functioning and more resilient watershed um, and that's all the things that we're working on so how everything comes together um, is really really exciting for me that's great thank you we have just a couple of minutes before we go to questions to draw people's attention to the resources in the chat is there anything else that our panelists would like to bring to people's attention of where they can learn more or get involved or further promote this work? Aisha, I have a feeling you have an answer. Well, you know, in terms of the work that we at Sustainable Conservation are doing, um, our webpage at uh, suscon, S-U-S-C-O-N.org, uh, we, we have a technical resources page. So, you can learn a lot about each of our programs there if you want to dive in. More generally speaking, um, you know, I think understanding where your water comes from is really important, where your drinking water comes from. Some people already know, uh, they're intimately involved with it. But a lot of folks, especially if you live in a city, you don't necessarily know where your water comes from. And so taking a look at it, let's say you're in the Bay Area, a lot of folks I think on this webinar are, uh, you're, you're getting your water either from the Mokolomi uh, watershed or Tuolumne watershed, I believe. Um, and, uh, you know, how does that water get all the way from there to, to your faucet? It's really interesting. And, and who are the communities that it bypasses? And, and what's, what's the system that set that up in the first place? There's a lot of people in the valley who don't have access to safe drinking water. Uh, if they have any water at all. So they might have a water quantity issue, they might have a water quality issue, or they might have both. And it, we're really, you know, thinking about, you know, kind of the rural and urban divide, um, really trying to understand where your water comes from, how it gets there, but also where other people's water is coming from. And, and I think once we kind of get a little bit more understanding about our real water situation, um, there's just more opportunity to develop solutions and positive outcomes. I agree, but sometimes it's daunting to know where your water comes from. Where I live in Southern California, we have six sources. So, you know, that's a lot of places. Where I grew up in the Imperial Valley, we only had one source. We had un, undiluted, unblended, and completely Colorado River water. And so we it was an easy question to answer. Everybody knew where their water came from. Ryan. What would be the one thing you would tell people to get more involved or to help promote our work? Well, again, I'll direct you all to the website, the resource we put in here, but I, I think just what can you do as individuals uh, and kind of the actions you take? I think a lot about food. So I'll, I'll talk about food. Uh, when you're buying food, pay attention to where it's coming from, how it's grown, and put your money towards food that's produced more sustainably. Uh, these are all businesses and our supply chains and our market reacts to what you buy. So uh, I think that's a very powerful tool everyone has. When in doubt, if you don't know, because that's also really complicated to understand, uh, buy Californian. California, <laughs> California food, what's grown here is typically going to be less impactful than food that's grown in other parts of the U.S. or the world. Um, and then lastly, I'd say uh, minimize your own food waste and whatever food waste you do have, compost it and get it back into the ground. Uh, so that's what you all can do. That's right. You should be thinking about composting in terms of feeding your own backyard. 
And that will save you money also because you're not going to be, you don't need to buy fertilizer for your trees and flowers or bushes or your vegetable garden. Erica, what would you add? Well, in, in regards to habitat restoration, I think uh, a lot of folks don't fully know what that looks like on the ground. They might see pictures on the internet. Uh, they might hear stories. They'll hear um, folks like me talking about it. But um, even some of our, you know, our policymakers and a lot of um, agency folks who are not on the ground folks, they they don't always have the opportunity uh, to see restoration project sites. So uh, for anybody, I recommend you go out and check out a place like Dos Rios Preserve. It's now a state park. And so you can go take a look yourself and see the outcomes of this restoration. You can look on our website again, our website and our web page, acceleratingrestoration.org, see some project examples before and after pictures. It really gives, gives a good sense of kind of, you know, what types of in interventions are needed. And I think everybody can benefit from that. And then let your uh, elected officials know that it's really important to support policies and funding uh, for programs and restoration projects that help um, build cli climate resilience. So uh, let your decision makers know it's important to you. Thank you. We have two questions that I can see from the audience. Uh, the first one is, are you at Sustainable Conservation or any of your partners actively engaged in any climate mitigation adaptation and or ecological habitat and biodiversity indicators, criteria work, data, collection, measurement, monitoring, and reporting, not only at the natural resource level, but also at the destination or regional level. Who wants to take this one? I can just start by saying, yes, all of your work at Sustainable Conservation moves towards creating increased resiliency in California. So all of it adds to that. And in terms of data collection, when I think about 20 years ago, the data that we had at our fingertips versus the data that's generated today, it just blows you away. We have so much more information, data that actually can inform us and help us make decision making uh, decisions and policy development that is much more accurate because it is informed. So I would say, I think we're there. We've, we are accomplishing all those things. And if you'd like to know more, go to the website and you can hear more, you can read more about it. The next question we have is about one of my favorite animals, beavers. Um, beavers are very important, our questioner writes, in storing groundwater, removing pollutants, lowering water temperatures and promoting riparian vegetation and reconnecting reconnection within the floodplains. Are you working with cowfish and wildlife to improve the watersheds? Or we could say, are you working with beavers? Or are you just working as if you were a beaver? I, I can take that one, Celeste. Um, certainly our accelerating re restoration program is trying to promote uh, the benefits of uh, habit, the habitat benefits that and groundwater uh, recharge benefits that beavers create. And we have actually included projects like beaver dam analogs and, and similar things uh, in some of the efficient permits for restoration that we've created and uh, certainly supporting the California Department of Fish and Wildlife and others. Uh, I have colleagues um, as well, maybe Asia, I believe, as well as uh, Stephanie Falzone, who've been working on beaver promotion as well. Aisha, you wanna? Yeah, um, a couple of years ago, we did look into um, beavers as an approach to, uh, you know, as kind of an integrating approach to our work. Uh, and we looked specifically in the San Joaquin Valley. Uh, that's a lot of where our Water for the Future work, our program work is in the San Joaquin Valley, not limited, but a preponderance of it is there. And, you know, honestly, I was pretty surprised to, learn from many of the interviews that we did with, with folks on the ground is that there are beavers in the San Joaquin Valley. Um, and they're basically such resilient creatures. Um, they're basically go where there's water and trees. And you know, you just give them the opportunity, they will come. And sometimes they're not always welcome. Uh, they can be very uh, destructive if you know they're flooding out highways or people's homes. 
Um, but there are many people working on ways to uh, cohabitate or to live uh, peacefully with beavers. Um, and these, you know, kind of like beaver deceiver uh, devices or ways to um, kind of work with them to make it so they don't block culverts and things like that. Um, I would say, you know, the, the folks who are really at the forefront of this work uh, right now that I know about are the Occidental Arts and Ecology Center. They have their Water Institute works a lot with beavers. They've been instrumental in getting this at the attention at the state level, um, getting this program. You know, many people are involved. It's not just them. But if you want to learn more about beavers and, and all the people working on them, go to their website up there. Um, and we are uh, interested in learning more. Uh, we're not beaver experts, um, but definitely Myself, I'm an environmental engineer. Um, and I was working on creek restoration projects when I first learned about beavers and realizing they know a lot more than a lot of us do in the field. So uh, so it's, it's really an opportunity to really take uh, ecological learning and natural infrastructure, you know, learn a lot from the beavers in, in our approach to kind of our more human-centered, um, you know, issues and projects. Of the various beaver projects, and most of them I learned about from Occidental, um, the thing that I always walked away with is the beavers are so adaptive. If their dam gets washed out, they work all night and just build a new one. And, you know, it's hard to get that kind of response anywhere. So beavers can really do, can really keep us uh, moving forward. We're learning a lot from those in the past. And in all of our our work that we do is informed by native competency where people have been living here for thousands of years and have figured out how things work and how best to work and live within this environment. And so that's, that's new for us to be embracing that information and realizing it makes so much sense. Um, the idea of finding integration across all of these traditional silos where each dollar you invest can fix three or four or five pro problems. It's not just your one little problem that you're focusing on, but a multiplicity of problems. Our dollars go faster, the projects go further, our, the projects are more resilient and they're able to withstand a variety of natural impacts. We're seeing you know, arc storms of greater magnitude than, than what we've seen before, droughts that are deeper, than what we've seen, fires that are greater and moving faster, all of the things. No Californian has been, I think, blind or spared through the impacts of climate change, um, even for the very fact that I'm coming to you out of another office in another county because my county has no power. So we see it all around us. We're coming towards the end of our uh, session with you all. Any last comments from our panelists? Yeah, I have something that I'd like to say. I, I, you know, I, I, I just want to take this opportunity uh, to thank our partners uh, at both the agencies and project implementers who are out there because, you know, really in our program, a lot of what we do is, is you know, we're, we're here to support you and work together so we can all do more <laughs> together. Uh, and I, I, I know my colleagues feel the same way. You know, we're all just uh, working to collaborate more and um, we're all working under our own sets of pressures to try and get this important work done. So just to thanks so much everybody for all that you do. And also to our, our funders, our donors, because indeed this work would not be possible without your help. That's right. And we're always ever get grateful for those who help support it financially. Well, that's the perfect note to end on. Thank you, Asia, Erica, and Ryan for joining us today and sharing your expertise. We greatly appreciate you taking the time and thank you to everyone for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed this conversation and we'll be sending you the recording uh, soon in case you've missed anything or would like to revisit it. Uh, this was the Sustainable Conservation's last webinar for 2024. We are coming up to the end of it, of 2024. Uh, but we'll be back in the spring in 2025. If you have any feedback on the webinar series or topics you'd be interested in seeing discussed, please reach out to us via email. If you'd like to follow Sustainable Conservation's work, please find us on social media, subscribe to our email list, or consider a donation. 
These webinars and our program work are fueled by generous contributors of organizations and individuals like you. All new and increased donations are currently matched dollar for dollar. So please consider donating by visiting suscon.org slash give or by scanning the QR, QR code on your screen. Thank you again for joining and have a great day. We'll keep that slide up for just a few minutes so people have a chance to get their cameras out and scan it. Thank you very much.